Chapter 1. Propped upon a mountain of satin pillows amid rumpled bed linens, Helene. Devonay surveyed his bronzed, muscular torso with an appreciative smile as Stephen David Elliot Westmoreland, Earl of Langford, Baron of Illingwood. Fifth Viscount Hargrove, Viscount Ashbourne, shrugged into the frilled shirt. He'd tossed over the foot of the bed last night. Are we still attending the theatre next week? she asked. Stephen glanced at her in surprise as he picked up his neckcloth. Of course. Turning to the mirror above the fireplace, he met her gaze in it while he deftly wrapped the fine white silk into intricate folds around his neck. Why did you need to ask? Because the season begins next week, and Monica Fitzwearing is coming to town. I heard it from my dressmaker, who is also hers. And? he said, looking steadily at her in the mirror, his expression betraying not even a flicker of reaction. With a sigh, Helene rolled onto her side and leaned on an elbow, her tone. Regretful but frank. And gossip is it that you're finally going to make her the offer she and her father have been waiting for these three years past. Is that what the gossips are saying? He asked casually, but he lifted his brows slightly, in a gesture that silently, and very effectively, managed to convey his displeasure with Helene for introducing a topic that he clearly felt was none of her concern. Helene noted the unspoken reprimand and the warning it carried, but she took advantage of what had been a remarkably open and highly pleasurable affair for both of them for several years. In the past, there have been dozens of rumors that you were on the verge of offering for one aspiring female or another, she pointed out quietly, and, until now, I have never asked you to verify or deny any of them. Without answering, Stephen turned from the mirror and picked up his evening jacket from the flowered chaise long. He shoved his arms into the sleeves, then he walked over to the side of the bed and finally directed all his attention to the woman in it. Standing there, looking down at her, he felt his annoyance diminish considerably. Propped up on her elbow, with her golden hair spilling over her naked back and breasts, Helene de Vinay was a delectable sight. She was also intelligent, direct, and sophisticated, all of which made her a thoroughly delightful mistress both in and out of bed. He knew she was too practical to nurture any secret hopes of a marriage offer from him, which was absolutely out of the question for a woman in her circumstances, and she was too independent to have any real desire to tie herself to someone for life traits that further solidified their relationship. Or so he had thought. But now you are asking me to confirm or deny that I intend to offer for Monica Fitzwearing? He asked quietly. Helene gave him a warm, seductive smile that normally made his body respond. I am. Brushing back the sides of his jacket, Stephen put his hands on his hips and regarded her coolly. And if I said yes? Then, my lord, I would say that you are making a great mistake. You have a fondness for her, but not a great love nor even a great passion. All she has to offer you is her beauty, her bloodlines, and the prospect of an heir. She hasn't your strength of will, nor your intelligence and although she may care for you, she will never understand you. She will bore you in bed and out of it, and you will intimidate, hurt, and anger her. Thank you, Helene. I must count myself fortunate that you take such an interest in my personal life and that you are so willing to share your expertise on how I ought to live it. The stinging set down caused her smile to fade a little but not disappear. There, you see? she asked softly. I am duly chastened and forewarned by that tone of yours, but Monica Fitzwearing would be either completely crushed or mortally offended. She watched his expression harden at the same time his voice became extremely polite, chillingly so. My apologies, madam, he said, inclining his head in a mockery of a bow, if I have ever addressed you in a tone that is less than civil. Reaching up, Helene tugged on his jacket in an attempt to make him sit down on the bed beside her. When this failed, she dropped her hand, but not the issue, and widened her smile to soothe his temper. 
You never speak to anyone in an uncivil tone, Stephen. In fact, the more annoyed you are, the more civil you become until you are so very civil, so very precise and correct, that the effect is actually quite alarming. One might even say, terrifying. She shivered to illustrate, and Stephen grinned in spite of himself. That is what I meant, she said, smiling back at him. When you grow cold and angry, I know how. Her breath caught as his large hand slipped down beneath the sheet and covered her breast, his fingers tantalizing her. I merely wish to warm you, he said, as she reached her arms around his neck and drew him down on the bed. And distract me. I think a fur would do a far better job of that. Of warming me? Of distracting you, he said as his mouth covered hers, and then he went about the pleasurable business of warming, and distracting, both of them. It was nearly five o'clock in the morning when he was dressed again. Stephen? She whispered sleepily as he bent and pressed a farewell kiss. Upon her smooth brow? Huh? I have a confession. No confessions, he reminded her. We agreed on that from the beginning. No confessions, no recriminations, no promises. That was the way we both wanted it. Helene didn't deny it, but this morning she couldn't make herself comply. My confession is that I find myself rather annoyingly jealous of Monica. Fit swearing. Stephen straightened with an impatient sigh, and waited, knowing she was determined to have her say, but he did not help her do it. He simply regarded her with raised brows. I realize you need an heir, she began, her full lips curving into an embarrassed smile, but could you not wed a female whose looks pale a little? In comparison with mine? Someone shrewish too. A shrew with a slightly crooked nose or small eyes would suit me very well. Stephen chuckled at her humor, but he wanted the subject closed permanently, and so he said. Monica Fitzwaring is no threat to you, Helene. I've no doubt she knows of our relationship and she would not try to interfere, even if she thought she could. What makes you so certain? She volunteered the information, he said flatly, and when Helene still looked unconvinced, he added. In the interest of putting an end to your concern and to this entire topic, I'll add that I already have a perfectly acceptable heir in my brother's son. Furthermore, I have no intention of adhering to custom, now or in future, by shackling myself to a wife for the sole purpose of begetting a legal heir of my own body. As Stephen came to the end of that blunt speech, he watched her expression change from surprise to amused bafflement. Her next remark clarified the reason for her obvious quandary. If not to beget an heir, what other possible reason could there be for a man such as you to wed at all? Stephen's disinterested shrug and brief smile dismissed all the other usual reasons for marriage as trivial, absurd, or imaginary. For a man such as I, he replied with a mild amusement that failed to disguise his genuine contempt for the twin farces of wedded bliss and the sanctity of marriage two illusions that flourished even in the brittle, sophisticated social world he inhabited. There does not seem to be a single compelling reason to commit matrimony. Helene studied him intently, her face alight with curiosity, caution, and the dawning of understanding. I always wondered why you didn't marry Emily Lathrop. In addition to her acclaimed face and figure, she is also one of the few women in England who actually possesses the requirements of birth and breeding in enough abundance to make her worthy of marrying into the Westmoreland family and of producing your rare. Everyone knows you fought a duel with her husband because of her, yet you didn't kill him, nor did you marry her a year later, after old Lord Lathrop finally keeled over and cocked up his toes. His brows rose in amusement at her use of irreverent slang for Lathrop's death, but his attitude toward the duel was as casual and matter-of-fact as her own. Lathrop got some maggot into his head about defending Emily's honor and putting a stop to all the rumors about her, by challenging one of her alleged lovers to a duel. I will never understand why the poor old man chose me from amongst a legion of viable candidates. 
Whatever method he used, its obvious age had addled his mind. Stephen eyed her curiously. Why do you say that? Because your skill with pistols, and your skill on the dueling field, are both rather legendary. Any child of ten could have won a duel with Lathrop, Stephen said, ignoring her praise of his abilities. He was so old and frail he couldn't steady his own pistol or hold it level. He had to use both hands. And so you let him leave Rockham Green unscathed? Stephen nodded. I felt it would be impolite of me to kill him, under the circumstances. Considering that he forced the duel on you in the first place, by calling you out in front of witnesses, it was very kind of you to pretend to miss your shot, in order to spare his pride. I did not pretend to miss my shot, Helene, he informed her, and then he pointedly added. I delipped. To delope constituted an apology and therefore implied an admission of guilt. Thinking he might have some other explanation for standing twenty paces from his opponent and deliberately firing high into the air instead of at Lord Lathrop, she said slowly. Are you saying you really were Emily Lathrop's lover? You were actually guilty. A sin, Stephen averred flatly. May I ask you one more question, my lord? You can ask it, he specified, struggling to hide his mounting impatience. With her unprecedented and unwelcome preoccupation with his private life. In a rare show of feminine uncertainty, she glanced away as if to gather her courage, then she looked up at him with an embarrassed, seductive smile. That he might have found it irresistible had it not been immediately followed by a line of questioning so outrageous that it violated even his own lax standards of acceptable decorum between the sexes. What was it about Emily Lathrop that drew you to her bed? His instant aversion to that question was completely eclipsed by his negative reaction to her next. I mean, was there anything she did with you or for you or to you, that I do not do when we're in bed together? As a matter of fact, he replied in a lazy drawl, there was one thing Emily did that I particularly liked. In her eagerness to discover another woman's secret, Helene overlooked the sarcasm edging his voice. What did she do that you particularly liked? His gaze dropped suggestively to her mouth. Shall I show you? he asked, and when she nodded, he bent over her, bracing his hands on either side of her pillow so that his waist and hips were only inches above her head. You're absolutely certain you wish to take part in a demonstration? he asked in a deliberately seductive whisper. Her emphatic nod was playful and inviting enough to take the edge off his annoyance, leaving him caught somewhere between amusement and exasperation. Show me what she did that you particularly liked, she whispered, sliding her hands up his forearms. Stephen showed her by putting his right hand firmly over her mouth, startling her with a demonstration that matched his smiling explanation. She refrained from asking me questions like yours about you or anyone else. And that is what I particularly liked. She gazed back at him, her blue eyes wide with frustrated chagrin, but this time she did not fail to notice the implacable warning in his deceptively mild voice. Do we have an understanding, my inquisitive beauty? She nodded then boldly attempted to tip the balance of power into her favor by delicately running her tongue across his palm. Stephen chuckled at her ploy and moved his hand, but he was no longer in the mood for sexual play or for conversation, and so he pressed a brief kiss on her forehead and left. Outside, a wet gray fog blanketed the night, broken only by the faint eerie glow of lamplights along the street. Stephen took the reins from the relieved footman and spoke soothingly to the young pair of much chestnuts who were stamping their hooves and tossing their manes. It was the first time they had been driven in the city, and as Stephen loosened the reins to let them move into a trot, he noted that the curb horse was extremely skittish in the fog. Everything unnerved the animal, from the sound of his own hooves clattering on the cobbled streets to the shadows beneath the street lamps. When a door slammed off to the left, he shied, 
then tried to break into a run. Stephen automatically tightened the reins, and turned the carriage down Middlebury Street. The horses were moving at a fast trot and seemed to be settling down a bit. Suddenly an alley cat screamed and bolted off a fruit cart, sending an avalanche of apples rumbling into the street. At the same time the door of a pub was flung open, splashing light into the street. Pandemonium broke loose, dogs held, the horses slipped and bolted frantically, and a dark figure staggered out of the pub, disappeared between two carriages drawn up at the curb, and then materialized directly in front of Stephen's carriage. Stephen's warning shout came too late. Chapter 2 Leaning heavily on his cane, the ancient butler stood in the shabby drawing room and listened in respectful silence as his illustrious visitor imparted the news that the butler's employer had just met an untimely demise. Not until Lord Westmoreland had finished his tale did the servant permit himself to show any reaction, and even then, Hodgkin sought only to reassure. How very distressing, my lord for poor Lord Bolton, and for you as well. But then, accidents do happen, don't they, and one cannot blame oneself. Mishaps are mishaps, and that's why we call them that. I'd hardly call running a man down and killing him a mishap. Stephen retorted, with a bitterness that was directed at himself, not the servant. Although the early morning accident had been much the fault of the drunken, young baron who'd bounded into the street in front of Stephen's carriage, there. Fact was that Stephen had been holding the reins, and he was alive and unharmed, while young Bolton was dead. Furthermore, it seemed that there was no one to mourn Bolton's passing, and at the moment, that seemed a final injustice to Stephen. Surely, your employer must have some family somewhere, someone to whom I could explain personally about the accident, Hodgkin merely shook his head, distracted by the dire realization that he was suddenly unemployed again and likely to remain so for the rest of his life. He'd obtained this position only because no one else had been willing to work as butler, valet, footman, and cook and for the absurdly small wages Bolton was able to pay. Embarrassed by his temporary lapse into self-pity and his lack of proper decorum, Hodgkin cleared his throat and hastily added. Lord Bolton had no close living relatives, as I, I said. And since I've only been in the Baron's employ for three weeks, his acquaintances aren't really known to. He broke off, a look of horror on his face. In my shock, I forgot about his fiancée. The nuptials were to take place this week. A fresh wave of guilt washed over Stephen, but he nodded and his voice became brisk and purposeful. Who is she and where can I find her? All I know is that she's an American heiress the Baron met when he was abroad, and that she's to arrive tomorrow on a ship from the colonies. Her father was too ill to make the voyage, so I presume she's either traveling with a relative or, perhaps, with a female companion. Last night, Lord Bolton was commemorating the end of his bachelorhood. That's all I know. You must know her name. What did Bolton call her? Caught between nervousness at Lord Westmoreland's terse impatience and shame at his own deteriorating memory, Hodgkin said a little defensively. As I said, I was new to the Baron's employ, and not taken into his confidence. In my presence, he, he called her my fiancé, or else my heiress. Think, man. You must have heard him refer to her name at some time. No, I, wait, yes. I do recall something, I recall that her name made me remember how very much I used to enjoy visiting Lancashire as a boy. Lancaster! Hodgkin exclaimed in delight. Her surname is Lancaster, and her given name is Sharon. No, that's not it. Chiras. Chiras Lancaster. Hodgkin was rewarded for his efforts with a slight nod of approval accompanied by yet another rapid-fire question. What about the name of her ship? 
Hodgkin was so encouraged and so proud that he actually banged his cane upon the floor with glee as the answer popped into his mind. The Morning Star. He crowed, then flushed with embarrassment at his boisterous tone and unseemly behavior. Anything else? Every detail could be helpful when I deal with her. I do recall some other trifles, but I shouldn't like to indulge in idle gossip. Let's hear it, Stephen said with unintended curtness. The lady is young and quite a pretty little thing, the Baron said. I also gathered that she was rather madly in love with him and wanted the union, while it was the Baron's title that was of primary interest to her father. Stephen's last hope that this marriage was simply one of convenience had died at the news that the girl was madly in love with her fiancé. What about Burton? He asked as he pulled on his gloves. Why did he want the marriage? I can only speculate, but he seemed to share the young lady's feelings. Wonderful, Stephen murmured grimly, turning toward the door. Not until Lord Westmoreland left did Hodgkin permit himself to give in to despair at his own predicament. He was unemployed and virtually penniless again. A moment ago, he'd almost considered asking, even begging, Lord Westmoreland to recommend him to someone, but that would have been inexcusably presumptuous, as well as futile. As Hodgkin had discovered during the two years it had taken him to finally obtain a position with Lord Burton, no one wanted a butler, valet, or footman whose hands were spotted with age and whose body was so old and so stooped that he could neither straighten it nor force it to a brisk walk. His thin shoulders drooping with despair, his joints beginning to ache. Dreadfully, Hodgkin turned and shuffled toward his room at the back of their shabby apartment. He was halfway there when the Earl's sharp, impatient knock forced him to make his slow way back to the front door. Yes, my lord, he said. It occurred to me as I was leaving, Lord Westmoreland said in a curt, business-like voice, that Burlton's death will deprive you of whatever wages he owed you. My secretary, Mr. Wheaton, will see that you're compensated. As he turned to leave, he added, my households are always in need of competent staff. If you aren't longing for retirement right now, you might consider contacting Mr. Wheaton about that as well. He'll handle the details. And then he was gone. Hodgkin closed the door and turned, staring in stunned disbelief at the dingy room while vigor and youth began to surge and rush warmly through his veins. Not only did he have a position to go to, but a position in a household belonging to one of the most admired, influential noblemen in all of Europe. The position hadn't been offered out of pity, of that Hodgkin was almost certain, for the Earl of Langford wasn't known as the sort of man to coddle servants, or anyone else. In fact, rumor had it that the Earl was a rather distant, exacting, man, with the highest standards for his households and his servants. Despite that, Hodgkin couldn't completely suppress the humiliating notion that the Earl might have offered him employment out of pity, until he suddenly remembered something the Earl had said, something that filled Hodgkin with pleasure and pride. Lord Westmoreland had specifically implied that he regarded Hodgkin as competent. He'd used that very word. Competent. Slowly, Hodgkin turned toward the hall mirror, and with his hand upon the handle of his black cane, he gazed at his reflection. Competent. He straightened his spine, though the effort was a bit painful, then he squared his narrow shoulders. With his free hand he reached down and carefully smoothed the front of his faded black jacket. Why, he didn't look so very old, Hodgkin decided not a day over three and seventy. Lord Westmoreland certainly hadn't thought him decrepit or useless. No, indeed. Stephen David Elliot Westmoreland, the Earl of Langford, thought Albert. Hodgkin would be a worthy addition to his staff. Lord Westmoreland, who possessed estates all over Europe, along with noble titles inherited through his mother and two ancestors who'd named him as their heir, thought Albert Hodgkin would be a worthy addition to one of his magnificent households. Hodgkin tipped his head to the side, trying to imagine how he would look. Wearing the elegant Langford livery of green and gold, 
but his vision seemed to blur and waver. He lifted his hand, his long thin fingers touching, feeling at the corner of his eye, where there was unfamiliar wetness. He brushed the tear away, along with the sudden, crazy impulse to wave his cane in the air and dance a little jig. Dignity, Hodgkin very strongly felt, was far more appropriate in a man who was about to join the household staff of Lord Stephen Westmoreland. Chapter 3 the sun was a fiery disc sliding into the purple horizon by the time a seaman walked down the dock to the coach that had been waiting there since morning. There she is the morning star, he told Stephen, who had been leaning against the door of the vehicle, idly watching a drunken brawl taking place outside a nearby pub. Before raising his arm to point out the ship, the seaman cast a cautious glance at the two coachmen, who both held pistols in clear view and who were obviously not as indifferent as their master to the dangers lurking everywhere on the wharf. That's her, right there, he said to Stephen, indicating a small ship just gliding into port, its sails dim silhouettes in the deepening twilight. And she's only a bit late. Straightening, Stephen nodded to one of the coachmen, who tossed the seaman a coin for his trouble, then he walked slowly down the dock, wishing that his mother or his sister-in-law could have been here with him when Burlton's bride disembarked. The presence of concerned females might have helped soften the blow when he delivered the tragic news to the girl, news that was going to shatter her dreams. This is a nightmare. Sheridan Bromley cried at the astonished cabin boy who'd come to tell her for the second time that a gentleman was waiting for her on the pier, a gentleman she naturally assumed was Lord Burlton. Tell him to wait. Tell him I died. No, tell him we're still indisposed. She shoved the door closed, shot the bolt, then pressed her back to the panel, her gaze darting to the frightened maid who was perched on the edge of the narrow cot in the cabin they'd shared, twisting a handkerchief in her plump hands. It's a nightmare, and when I wake up in the morning, it will all be over, won't it, Meg? Meg shook her head so vigorously that it set the ribbons on her white cap. Bobbing. It's no dream. You'll have to talk to the Baron and tell him something something that won't vex him, and something he'll believe. Well, that certainly eliminates the truth, Sheridan said bitterly. I mean, he's bound to be just a trifle miffed if I tell him I've managed to misplace his fiancée somewhere along the English coastline. The truth is I lost her. You didn't lose her, she eloped. Mistress ran off with Mr. Morrison when we stopped in the last port. Regardless of that, what matters is that she was entrusted to my care, and I failed in my duty to her further and to the Baron. There's nothing to do but go out there and tell the Baron that. You mustn't. Meg cried. He'll have us thrown straight into a dungeon. Besides, you have to make him feel kindly toward us because we have no one else to turn to, nowhere to go. Mistress took all the money with her, and there isn't a shilling to buy passage home. I'll find some sort of work. Despite her confident words, Sherry's voice trembled with strain, and she looked about the tiny cabin, unconsciously longing for somewhere to hide. You don't have any references, Meg argued, her voice filling with tears. And we don't have anywhere to sleep tonight and no money for lodgings. We're going to land in the gutter. Or worse. What could be worse? Sheridan said, but when Meg opened her mouth to answer, Sherry held up a hand and said with a trace of her normal humor and spirit. No, don't, I beg you. Don't even consider white slavery. Meg paled and her mouth fell open, her voice dropping to a dazed whisper. White. Slavery. Meg. For heaven's sake, I meant it as a, a joke. A tasteless joke. If you go out there and tell him the truth, they'll toss both of us straight. Into a dungeon. Why, Sherry burst out, closer to hysterics than she'd ever been in her life, do you keep talking about a dungeon? Because there's laws here, miss, and you we we've broken some. Not on purpose. Of course, but they won't care. 
Here, they toss you into dungeon no questions asked, nor answers heard. Here, there's only one sort of people who matter, and they're the quality. What if he thinks we killed her, or stole her money, or sold her, or something evil like that? It would be his word against yours, and you aren't nobody, so the law will be on his side. Sheridan tried to say something reassuring or humorous, but her physical and emotional stamina had both suffered from weeks of unabated tension and stress, compounded by a long bout of illness during the voyage, followed by Jiraz's disappearance two days ago. She should never have embarked on this mad scheme in the first place, she realized. She'd overestimated her ability to cope with a spoiled, foolish 17-year-old girl, convincing herself that her common sense and practical nature, combined with her experience teaching deportment at Miss Talbot's school for young ladies, which Chiraz had attended, would enable her to deal admirably with any difficulties that arose on the trip. Chiraz's dear father had been so deluded by Sheridan's brisk, competent manner that, when his heart ailment suddenly prevented him from traveling to England, he'd chosen Sheridan over several older, more experienced, applicants to escort his daughter to England Sheridan, who was barely three years older than she. Of course, Chiraz had something to do with his decision, she wheedled and sulked and insisted that Miss Bromley be the one to accompany her, until he finally conceded. Miss Bromley had been the one who helped her write her letters to the Baron. Miss Bromley, she told him, wasn't like those other sour-faced companions he'd interviewed. Miss Bromley would be amusing company. Miss Bromley, she warned him slyly, wouldn't let her become so homesick that she wanted to return to America and her papa, instead of marrying the Baron. That was certainly true, Sheridan thought with disgust. Miss Bromley was probably responsible for her elopement with a near stranger, an impulsive act that loosely resembled the plot of one of the romantic novels that Sheridan had shared with Chiraz on the voyage. Aunt Cornelia was so opposed to those novels, and to those foolish romantic notions they put forth, that Sheridan normally read them only in secret, with the curtains closed around her cot. There, in solitude, she could experience the delicious excitement of being loved and courted by dashing, handsome noblemen who stole her heart with a glance. Afterward, she could lie back on the pillows, close her eyes, and pretend that she had been the heroine, dancing at a ball in a glorious gown with pale golden hair in an elaborate upsweep, strolling in the park with her dainty hand resting upon his sleeve and her pale golden hair peeping from beneath the brim of her fashionable bonnet. She'd read each novel so many times that she could recite her favorite scenes from memory and substitute her own name for the heroines. The Baron captured Sheridan's hand and pressed it to his lips as he pledged his eternal devotion. You are my one and only love. The Earl was so overwhelmed by Sheridan's beauty that he lost control and kissed her cheek. Forgive me, but I cannot help myself. I adore you. And then there was her particular favorite, the one she most often liked. To imagine. The prince took her in his strong embrace and clasped her to his heart. If I had a hundred kingdoms, I would trade them all for you, my dearest love. I was nothing until you. Lying in bed, she would alter the plots of the novels, the dialogue, and even the situations and locales to suit herself, but she never, ever changed her imaginary hero. The and he alone remained ever constant, and she knew every detail about him, because she had designed him herself. He was strong and masculine and forceful, but he was kind and wise and patient and witty, as well. He was tall and handsome too with thick dark hair and wonderful blue eyes that could be seductive or piercing or sparkle with humor. He would love to laugh with her, and she would tell him amusing anecdotes too. Make him do it. He would love to read, and he would be more knowledgeable than she and perhaps a bit more worldly. But not too worldly or proud or sophisticated. She hated arrogance and stuffiness and she particularly disliked being arbitrarily ordered about. She accepted such things from the fathers of her students at school, but she knew she wouldn't be able to abide such a superior male attitude from her husband. And, of course, 
her imaginary hero would become her husband. He would propose on bended knee, and say things like, I didn't know there was happiness, until you. I didn't know what love was, until you. I was only half a man with half a heart, until you. She liked the idea of being truly needed by her imaginary hero, of being valued for more than beauty. After he proposed with such sweet, compelling words, how could she do anything but accept? And so, to the envious surprise of everyone in Richmond, Virginia, they would be married. Afterward, he would whisk her, and Aunt Cornelia, off to his wonderful mansion on a hill, where he would devote himself to making them happy, and where their most pressing worry would be which gowns to wear. He would help her locate her father, too, and he would come to live with them. Alone in the darkness, it didn't matter that she didn't have a prayer of meeting such a man or that if by some wild chance she did encounter such a paragon of perfection, he wouldn't give Miss Sheridan Bromley a passing glance. In the morning, she would scrape her thick red hair back off her forehead and fasten it into a practical coil at the nape, then she would leave for school, and no one would ever know that prim Miss Bromley, who was already regarded as a spinster by students, staff, and parents, was an incurable romantic in her heart. She'd fooled everyone, including herself, into thinking she was the epitome of practicality and efficiency. Now, as a result of Sheridan's boundless overconfidence, Churras was going to spend her life married to an ordinary mister, instead of my lord, a man who could make her life utterly miserable if he chose. If Churras's father didn't die of his fury and heartbreak, he was undoubtedly going to spend the rest of his life thinking of effective ways to make Sheridan's and Aunt Cornelia's lives miserable. And poor, timid Meg, who'd been Churras's overworked maid for five long years, was surely going to be turned out without a reference, which would effectively destroy her future prospects for obtaining a decent position. And these were the best possibilities. These prospects were based on the assumption that Sheridan and Meg might somehow be able to return home. If Meg was correct, and Sheridan was half convinced she was, then Meg was going to spend the rest of her life in a dungeon, and Sheridan Bromley, sensible, competent Sheridan Bromley, was going to be her cellmate. Tears of fear and guilt stung Sherry's eyes as she thought of the calamities she'd caused, and all because of her naive overconfidence and her foolish desire to see the glittering city of London in the fashionable aristocracy. She'd read about in her novels. She should have listened to Aunt Cornelia, who had lectured her for years that longing to see such wondrous sights was tantamount to reaching beyond one station in life, that pride was as sinful in the eyes of the Lord as greed and sloth, and that modesty in a female was far more attractive to gentlemen than mere beauty. Aunt Cornelia had been right in the first two of those beliefs, Sheridan belatedly realized. Sherry had tried to heed her aunt's warnings, but there was one major dissimilarity between her aunt and herself that made those warnings about going to England terribly difficult for Sherry to accept. Aunt Cornelia loved predictability. She thrived on rituals, treasured the identical day-to-day -day routines that sometimes made Sherry feel like weeping with despair. Chapter 4 As she stared blindly across the tiny cabin at poor Meg, Sherry wished very devoutly that she were back in Richmond, sitting across from her aunt in their tiny little three-room house they shared, enjoying a nice, routine pot of tepid tea, and looking forward to an entire lifetime of tepid tea and tedium. But if Meg was right about British laws, then Sheridan wouldn't be going home ever wouldn't set eyes on her aunt again, and that thought was almost her undoing. Six years ago, when she first went to live with her mother's elder sister, the prospect of never seeing Cornelia Faraday again would have made Sheridan positively gleeful, but Sheridan's father hadn't given her a choice. Until then, he had let her travel with him in a wagon loaded with all manner of goods from fur pelts and perfume to iron pots and pitchforks, luxuries and necessaries that he sold or bartered at farmhouses and cabins along their route. 
Their route was whichever fork in the road took their fancy when they came upon it, usually heading south, along the eastern seaboard, in winter and north in summer. Sometimes they turned west when a particularly glorious sunset beckoned, or they angled southwest because a gurgling stream angled in that direction. In winter, when the snow sometimes made traveling difficult or impossible, there was always a farmer or a storekeeper who had need of an extra pair of willing hands, and her Irish further would trade his labor for a few nights lodging. As a result, by the time Sheridan was twelve, she'd slept in everything from a blanket in a hayloft to a feather bed in a house populated by a bevy of laughing ladies who wore vivid satin gowns with necklines so low their bosoms seemed to be in danger of toppling right out of them. But whether the mistress of their lodgings was a robust farmer's wife or a stern-faced preacher's wife or a lady in a purple satin dress trimmed with black feathers, their hostesses nearly always ended up doting on Patrick and fussing maternally over Sheridan. Charmed by his ready smile, his unfailing courtesy, and his willingness to work hard and long for bed and board, the ladies soon began cooking extra-large portions for him, baking his favorite desserts and volunteering to mend his clothing. Their goodwill extended to Sheridan too. They teased her affectionately about her mop of bright red hair and laughed when her father referred to her as his little carrot. They let her stand on a stool when she volunteered to help wash dishes, and when she left, they gave her scraps of cloth or precious needles so she could fashion a new blanket or dress for her doll, Amanda. Sheridan hugged them and told them that she and Amanda were both very grateful, and they smiled because they knew she meant it. They kissed her goodbye and whispered that she was going to be very beautiful someday, and Sheridan laughed because she knew they couldn't possibly mean it. Then they watched Sheridan and her papa drive off in the wagon while they waved goodbye and called out Godspeed and come back soon. Sometimes the people they stayed with hinted that her papa ought to remain to court one of their daughters or a neighbor's daughter, and the smile would remain on his handsome Irish face, but his eyes would darken as he said. I thank you, but no. Tud be bigamy, since Sheridan's mamma is still alive in my heart. The mention of Sheridan's mamma was the one thing that could dim the smile in his eyes, and Sheridan always grew tense until he was himself again. For months after her mama and baby brother died from an illness called their flux, her papa behaved like a silent stranger, sitting beside the fire in their tiny cabin, drinking whiskey, ignoring the crops that were dying in the field and not bothering to plant more. He didn't talk, didn't shave, hardly ate, and seemed not to care whether their mules starved or not. Sheridan, who was six at the time and accustomed to helping her mama, tried to take over her mother's chores. Her father seemed as unaware of Sheridan's efforts as he was of her failures and her grief. Then one fateful day, she burned both her arm and the eggs she'd cooked for him. Trying not to cry from the pain in her arm or the pain in her heart, she had lugged the wash down to the stream along with what was left of the lye soap. As she knelt on the bank and gingerly lowered her father's flannel shirt into the water, scenes from the happy past at this same spot came back to haunt her. She remembered the way her mama used to hum as she did the wash here while Sheridan supervised little Jamie's bath. She remembered the way Jamie used to sit in the water, gurgling happily, his chubby hands smacking the water in playful glee. Mama had loved to sing, she'd taught Sheridan songs from England and sung them with her while they worked. Sometimes she would stop singing and simply listen to Sheridan, her head tipped to the side, a strange, proud smile on her face. Often she would wrap Sheridan in a tight hug and say something wonderful. Like. Your voice is very sweet and very special just like you are. Memories of those idyllic days made Sheridan's eyes ache as she knelt at the stream. The words of her mama's favorite song whispered in her mind, along with the memory of her mama smiling, first at Jamie as he giggled and splashed, and then at Sheridan, who was usually getting soaked too. Sing something for us, she would say. Sing for us, Angel. Sheridan tried to obey the remembered request, but her voice broke and her eyes flooded with tears. With the heels of her hands, 
She rubbed the tears away only to discover that her father's shirt was now floating downstream, already out of the reach, and then Sheridan lost the battle to be brave and grown up. Drawing her knees against her chest, she buried her face in her mama's apron and sobbed with grief and terror. Surrounded by summer wildflowers and the scent of fresh grass, she rocked back and forth, crying until her throat ached and her words were only a croaking whisper chant. Mama, she wept. I miss you. I miss you. I miss you. I miss Jamie. Please come back to Papa and me. Please come back, please come back. Oh, please. I can't do it alone, Mama. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. Her litany of grief was suddenly interrupted by her father's voice, not there. Dull, lifeless, terrifyingly unfamiliar voice he'd had for months, but his old voice hoarse now with concern and love. Crouching beside her, he pulled her into his arms. I can't do it alone either, he'd said, cradling her tightly against him. But I'll wager we can do it together, sweeting. Later, after he'd mopped her tears, he'd said. How would you like to leave here and go traveling, just you and me? We'll make every day an adventure. I used to have great adventures. That's how I met your mama. I was having an adventure in England, in Sherwin's Glen. Someday, we'll go back to Sherwin's Glen, you and me. Only not the way your mama and I left. This time, we'll go back in grand style. Before Sheridan's mama died, she'd talked nostalgically about the picturesque village in England where she'd been born, about its beautiful countryside, its tree-lined lanes, and the dances she'd attended at the assembly rooms there. She'd even named Sheridan after a particular kind of rose that bloomed at the parsonage a special species of red rose that she said bloomed in gay profusion along the white fence surrounding the parsonage. Sheridan's father's preoccupation with returning to Sherwin's Glen seemed to start after her mother's death. What puzzled Sheridan for a long while, however, was exactly why her papa wanted to go back there so badly, particularly when the most important man in the village seemed to be an evil, proud monster of a man named Squire Faraday who lorded it over everyone and who would not make a good neighbor at all when her papa built his mansion right next to his home, which was his intention. She knew her papa had first met Squire Faraday when he delivered a very valuable horse from Ireland that the squire had purchased for his daughter. And she knew that since her father had no close family alive in Ireland, he'd decided to stay on and work for the squire as a groom and horse trainer. But not until she was eleven years old did she discover that the wicked, cold-hearted, hateful, arrogant squire Faraday was actually her mama's own father. She'd always wondered why her father had taken her mother away from her beloved village and then spirited her off to America, along with her mother's elder sister, who then settled in Richmond and refused to budge another inch. It had always seemed a little strange that the only thing they took with them, besides the clothing on their persons and a small sum of money, was a horse called Finish Line, a horse that her mama had loved enough to bring along and pay his passage, and yet one she had sold soon after they arrived in America. The few times her parents had spoken of their departure from England, it had always seemed hasty somehow, and vaguely unhappy too but she couldn't imagine why that would have been so. Unfortunately, her father was adamantly unwilling to satisfy her curiosity on that score, which left her with no choice except to rein in her curiosity and wait until they built their mansion in Sherwin's Glen so that she could find out for herself. She planned to accomplish her goal by asking all sorts of carefully veiled questions once she got there. As far as she could tell, her father intended to accomplish his goal by gambling at cards and dice, with whatever money they could actually spare and as often as he found a good game of either underway. The fact that he simply wasn't lucky at cards and dice was apparent to both of them, but he believed all that would change someday. All I need, darling, he would say with a grin, is just one nice, long lucky streak at the right table.
I've had a few of those in my time, and my time is coming again. I can feel it. Since he never lied to her, Sherry believed it too. And so they traveled together, talking to each other about subjects as mundane as the habits of ants and as grand as the creation of the universe. To some people, their vagabond lifestyle must have seemed strange. It had seemed that way at first to Sherry too, strange and frightening, but she soon came to love it. Before they'd left the farm, she'd truly thought the whole wide world looked exactly like their own little patch of meadow and that hardly anyone existed beyond its boundaries. Now there were new sights to see around every bend in the road and the happy expectation of meeting interesting people along their route who were heading in the same direction travelers who were bound for, or en route from, places as distant and exotic as Mississippi, or Ohio, or even Mexico. From them, she heard wondrous stories of far-off places, amazing customs, and strange ways of life. And because she treated everyone as her papa did with friendliness, courtesy, and interest many of them chose to match their pace to the Bromelais wagon for days at a time or even weeks. Along the way, Sheridan learned even more, Ezekiel and Mary, a negro couple with skin like smooth shiny coal, springy black hair, and hesitant smiles told her about a place called Africa, where their names had been different. They taught her a strange, rhythmic chant that wasn't quite a song, yet it made her spirits heighten and quicken. A year after Mary and Ezekiel went their own way, a white-haired Indian, with skin as weathered and wrinkled as dried leather appeared around a bend in the road one grey winter day, mounted upon a beautiful spotted horse that was as young and energetic as his rider was old and weary. After considerable encouragement from Sheridan's father, he tied his horse to the back of the wagon, climbed aboard, and, in answer to Sheridan's inquiry, he said his name was Dog Lies Sleeping. That night, seated at their campfire, he responded to Sheridan's question about Indian songs by giving a strange demonstration of one, a demonstration that seemed to consist of guttural sounds accompanied by the beating of his palms on his knees. It sounded so odd and unmelodic that Sheridan had to bite back a smile for fear of hurting his feelings, and even then he seemed to sense her bewildered amusement. He broke off abruptly and narrowed his eyes. Now, he said, in his abrupt, commanding voice, you make song. By then, Sheridan was as used to sitting around campfires and singing with strangers as she was speaking to them and so she sang an Irish song that her papa had taught her about a young man who lost his love. When she got to the part about the young man weeping in his heart for his beautiful lassie, Dog Lies Sleeping made a strangled noise in his throat that sounded like a snort and a laugh. A swift glance across the fire at his appalled expression proved her guess was correct, and this time it was Sheridan who broke off in mid-note. Weeping, the Indian informed her, in a lofty, superior tone while pointing his finger at her, is for women. Oh, she said, chagrined. I, I guess Irish men are, well, different because the song says they cry, and Papa taught it to me, and he's Irish. She looked for confirmation to her father and said hesitantly. Men from the old country do cry, don't they, Papa? He shot her a laughing look as he dumped the dregs of his coffee onto there fire and said. Well, now, darling, what if I say they do, and Mr. Dog lies sleeping leaves us thinking for all time that Ireland's a sad place filled with sorry lads all weeping their hearts out and wearing them on their sleeves. That wouldn't be a good thing, would it? And yet, if I say they don't cry, then you might end up thinking the song and I lied, and that wouldn't be good. Either. With a conspiratorial wink, he finished. What if I say you misremembered the song, and it's really the Italians who cry? He'd phrased all that as if it were part of their favorite game of. What if? A game they'd invented and played often to pass the time during the three years they'd traveled together. Sometimes the game was about serious possibilities, such as what if their horse went lame. Sometimes it was silly. Like what if a fairy came and gave us one wish, but regardless of the premise, 
the goal was always to reach the best possible solution in the minimum amount of time. Sheridan had become so good at it that her father proudly declared that she made him work hard to stay even with her. Sheridan's brow furrowed in concentration for a brief moment, then she announced her solution with a merry giggle. I think you'd best pretend there's something you have to do right now, so you don't have to answer the question. If you say anything at all, it will land you in the briars for sure. You're right, he said, laughing. Then he took her advice after bidding Dog. Lies sleeping a polite good night. The light-hearted exchange didn't win even a glimmer of a smile from the stoic Indian, but across the fire, he gave Sheridan a long, intense look, then rolled to his feet and vanished into the woods for the night without a word. The following morning, Dog lies sleeping offered to let her ride his horse an honor that Sheridan suspected sprang from his desire to ride in the more comfortable wagon without actually having to admit it, and thereby save face. Sheridan, who had never ridden anything but the old, sway-backed horse that pulled their wagon, eyed the beautiful, spirited animal with a little excitement and a great deal of nervous panic. She was about to refuse when she caught the challenging look in the Indian's face. Carefully injecting a regretful tone into her voice, she pointed out that they didn't have a saddle. Dog lies sleeping gave her another of his lofty, superior looks and informed her that Indian maidens rode bareback and astride. His unblinking stare, combined with the feeling that he knew she was afraid, was more than Sheridan could endure. Prepare to risk her life and limb rather than give him a reason to have a low opinion of her, and all Irish children as well. She marched over to him and took the horse's rope from his hand. He didn't offer to help her mount, so she led the horse over to the wagon, climbed into it, then spent several minutes trying to maneuver the horse into a position close enough to swing her leg over its back. Once she was mounted, she wished she weren't. From atop the horse, the ground looked very far away, and very, very hard. She fell off five times that day and she could practically feel the Indian and his obstinate horse laughing at her. As she prepared to mount for her sixth attempt, she was so furious and so sore that she jerked on the lead rope, grabbed the horse's ear and called him a devil, using a German word for it that she'd been taught by a German couple heading for Pennsylvania, then she hoisted herself aboard and angrily took command of her mount. It took several minutes before she realized that Indian horses apparently responded better to rudeness than timidity, because the animal stopped sidestepping and bolting and settled into an exhilarating soft rot. That night, as she sat at the campfire watching her father cooking there. Supper, she shifted her position to ease the pressure on her sore backside. And inadvertently met the gaze of dog lies sleeping, something she'd been avoiding since she'd redid the horse to the wagon earlier that day. Instead of making some embarrassingly frank observation about her lack of riding ability in comparison to that of an Indian girl's, Dog Lies Sleeping looked at her steadily in the leaping firelight and asked what seemed an entirely inconsequential question. What does your name mean? What does my name mean? She repeated after a moment's thought. When he nodded, she explained that she'd been named for a flower that grew in her mother's land of England, a place across the sea. He made a disapproving grunt, and Sheridan was so startled that she said. Well, then, what should my name be? Not flower, you, he said, studying her freckled face and unruly hair. Fire, you. Flames. Burn bright. What? Oh, she said laughing as understanding dawned. You mean my hair looks like it's on fire because of its color? Despite his aloof manner, abrupt speech, and ill-behaved horse, Sheridan was, as usual, naturally friendly, incurably curious, and incapable of carrying a grudge for more than an hour. My papa calls me carrot because of my hair, she said with a smile. A carrot is an orange vegetable, like, like corn is a vegetable. She added. That is why he calls me Carrot. White men are not as good as Indians for giving names. Politely refraining from pointing out that being named for a dog wasn't. 
exactly preferable to being referred to as a vegetable, Sheridan said. What sort of name would an Indian give me? Hair of flames, he announced. If you were boy, name you wise for years. What? Sheridan asked blankly. You wise already, he clarified awkwardly. Wise, but not old. Young. Oh, I do like being called wise. Sheridan exclaimed, instantly reversing her earlier decision and deciding she liked him very well, indeed. Wise for years, she repeated, tossing a happy look at her amused father. You girl, he contradicted, dampening her glee with his attitude of male. Superiority. Girls not wise. Call you hair of flames. Sheridan decided to like him anyway and to stifle her indignant retort that. Her papa thought she was very smart indeed, contrary to his opinion. Hair of flames is a very nice name, she said instead. He smiled then for the first time, a knowing smile that took decades off his face and made it clear he was aware of her restraint in the face of his provocation. You wise for years, he said, his grin widening as he looked at her papa and nodded. Her father nodded his agreement in return, and Sheridan decided, as she often did, that life was really quite wonderfully exhilarating, and that no matter how different people seemed on the outside, on the inside they were much the same. They liked to laugh and talk and dream, and pretend that they were always brave, never in pain, and that sorrow was merely a bad mood that would soon pass. And which usually did. Chapter 5 At breakfast the next morning, her father complimented the beautiful braided and beaded belt that Dog Lies Sleeping wore around his deerskin breeches and discovered that the Indian had made it himself. Within moments, a business deal was struck, and Dog Lies Sleeping agreed to fashion belts and bracelets for her father to sell along their route. With their new partner's permission, she named the horse Runs Fast and in the days that followed, Sheridan rode him constantly. While her father and dog lies sleeping made their more dignified way along the trail in the wagon, she galloped ahead, then raced back to them, crouched low over the horse's neck, her hair tossing in the wind and mingling with the horse's flying mane, her laughter ringing out beneath the bright blue sky. On the same day she conquered her fear of a racing gallop, she proudly asked Dog Lies Sleeping if she was beginning to ride as well as an Indian boy. He looked at her as if such a possibility were absurd, as well as impossible, then he tossed the core of the apple he'd been eating into the grass beside the road. Can Wise for years pick that up from back of running horse? He replied, pointing to the core. Of course not, Sherry said, baffled. Indian boy do. In the three years that followed, Sherry learned to do that and a great many other feats some of which evoked worried warnings from her father. Dog Lies Sleeping greeted each of her successes with an offhand grunt of approval, followed by yet another new, seemingly impossible, challenge, and sooner or later, Sherry rose to everyone. Their income increased as a result of Dog Lies Sleeping's intricate handiwork and they ate much better as a result of his superior hunting and fishing skills. If people found them a peculiar trio the old Indian, the young girl who wore deerskin pants and who could ride not only bareback and astride but backward at a full-out gallop, and the amiable, soft-spoken Irishman who gambled regularly but with cautious restraint, Sherry didn't notice it. In fact, she rather thought the folk who lived in busy, crowded towns such as Baltimore, Augusta, and Charlotte led very odd, stifled lives compared to theirs. In fact, she didn't mind in the least that her papa was taking so long to win enough money to build their mansion in the village of Sherwin's Glen. She mentioned that very thing to Rafael Benaventi, a handsome, blue-eyed Spaniard in his mid-twenties, a few days after he decided to travel with them towards Savannah on his way from St. Augustine. Caramia he had said, laughing heartily. It is good you are not in a hurry, for your papa is a very bad gambler. 
I sat across from him last night in a little game at Madame Gertrude's establishment, and there was much cheating. My papa would never cheat. She'd protested, leaping to her feet in indignation. No, this I believe, he quickly assured her, catching her wrist as she whirled round. But he did not realize that others were cheating. You should have, her eyes dropped to the gun he wore at his hip, and she grew even angrier at the idea of someone cheating her papa out of their hard-earned money. Shot them. Yes, shot them all. That's what? That I could not do, Querida, he stated, while amusement again lit his face. Because, you see, I was one of the cheaters. Sheridan yanked her wrist free. You cheated my papa? No, no, he said, making an unsuccessful effort to sober his expression. I only cheat when it is entirely necessary such as when others are cheating and I only cheat those who would cheat me. As she later learned, Raphael was something of an expert at gambling, having been, by his own admission, cast out of his family's huge hacienda in Mexico as punishment for what he called his many bad ways. Sheridan, who prized her own tiny family, was dismayed to discover that some parents actually cast their children out, and she was equally dismayed at the thought that Raphael might have committed some sort of unspeakable deed to warrant that. When she cautiously broached the subject to her father, he put his arm reassuringly around her shoulders and said that Raphael had explained the real reason he'd been sent away by his family, and that it had something to do with caring too much for a lady who was unfortunately already married. Sheridan accepted his explanation without further question, not only because her father was always very careful about the character of any man allowed to travel with them for an extended length of time, but also because she wanted to think the best of Raphael. Although she was only twelve years old, she was positive Raphael Benaventi was the handsomest and the most charming man on earth with the exception of her father, of course. He told her wonderful stories, teased her about her ruffian ways, and told her that she was going to be a very, very beautiful woman some day. He said her eyes were as cool as grey storm clouds and that God had given them to her to go with the fire in her hair. Until then, Sheridan hadn't cared in the least about her appearance, but she hoped devoutly that Raphael was correct about her future looks and that he would wait around to find out. Until then she was content to bask in his company and be treated like a child. Unlike most of the travelers they encountered, Rafe always seemed to have plenty of money and no particular destination or goal in mind. He gambled more often than her father didn't spend his winnings as he pleased. One day, after they'd set up their wagon on the fringe of Savannah, Georgia, he disappeared for four days and nights. When he reappeared on the fifth day, he reeked of perfume and whiskey. Based on the snatches of conversation she'd overheard the year before among a group of married women heading to Missouri with their husbands in a small caravan, she concluded that Rafe's state was proof he'd been in the company of a harlot. Although she had an incomplete idea of what constituted a harlot, she knew from that same conversation that a harlot was a woman who was not respectable and who possessed some sort of evil power to lead a man away from the path of righteousness. Although Sherry did not know exactly what a woman did to become not respectable, she knew enough to react instinctively. When Rafe returned that day, unshaven and smelling of harlots, Sheridan had been on her knees, trying to phrase an awkward prayer for his safety and trying not to cry with fear. Within moments, she went from fear to jealous indignation, and she stayed aloof and angry for a record full day. When his cajolery didn't soften her, he shrugged and seemed not to care, but the following night, he strolled into their camp with a mischievous grin on his face and a guitar in his hands. Pretending to ignore her, he sat down across the fire from her and began to play. Sherry had heard other guitars played before, but not the way Rafe played. This one. Beneath his nimble fingers, the strings vibrated with a strange, pulsating rhythm that made her heart beat faster and her toes wiggle in her boots in time with the tempo. 
Then suddenly the tempo changed and the music became incredibly wistful and so sad that the guitar itself seemed to be crying. The third melody he played was light and gay, and he looked at her across the campfire, gave her a wink, and began to say the words that went with the song as if he were saying them to her. They told the story of a foolish man who didn't value the things he had or the woman who loved him until he lost everything. Before Sherry could react to the shock and possibilities of that, he began to play another melody, lovely and soft, a song she knew. Sing the words with me, queer Ida, he said lightly. Singing was a favorite pastime for many people when they traveled, including the Bromelaye group, but on that night, Sherry felt unaccountably shy and awkward before she closed her eyes and made herself think only of the music and the sky and the night. She sang along with him, his deep baritone a counterpoint to her higher notes. Several minutes later, she opened her eyes to the sound of applause and was stunned to see that a small group of campers from across the road had come over to listen to her. It was the first of many, many nights when she sang while Rafe played and a crowd gathered to listen. Sometimes, when they were in a village or town, people expressed their appreciation with gifts of food and even money. In the months that followed, Rafe taught her to play the guitar, though she never played as well as he did, and he taught her Spanish, which she spoke almost as well as he did, then Italian, which neither of them spoke very well. At Sherry's request, he kept an eye on the people her father gambled with, and her father's winnings began to increase. He even began to talk to Patrick about becoming partners in all sorts of ventures that sounded awfully exciting, and terribly unlikely to Sheridan, but her father always listened with interest. The only person who seemed to be less than pleased with Rafe's presence was Dog Lies Sleeping, who regarded the other man with open disapproval and refused to do more than grunt at him, and that only in answer to a pertinent, direct question. To Sherry, he became rather withdrawn, and when she unhappily sought her father's counsel on the subject, he said Dog Lies Sleeping probably felt bad because she didn't spend as much time talking with him as she had done before Rafe joined them. After that, Sherry made it a point to seek the Indian's advice and to ride beside him in the wagon more often than she rode beside Rafe. Geniality and accord returned to their tiny cavalcade and everything seemed perfect and permanent until her papa decided to pay a visit to her mama's spinster sister in Richmond, Virginia.